minority will pass legislation. I will fight like hell for you every single day, like I've always done and always will. Another stand. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Chantal Destra. As you know, it is election season. A few weeks ago, we unpacked the competitive congressional primaries in New York as both Republicans and Democrats are vying to gain control of the House of Representatives this year. But congressional representatives aren't the only ones up for re-election. In today's episode, we will be focusing on the competitive primaries and races for seats in the state legislature. Currently, Democrats hold a supermajority, giving the party unwavering legislative power. And as many lawmakers leave the legislature, either for other political ambitions or for retirement, the elections this year are even more consequential. To help understand the competitive races for state Senate and Assembly, we're joined in studio by John Campbell of WNYC in Gothamist. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. My pleasure. Now, I'm super excited to talk to you about these races. I think a natural place to start would be in the 69th Assembly District. We saw a pretty competitive um, Democratic primary between Micah Lasher and Eli Northrup. We know Lasher was most recently the former um, policy director under Governor Kathy Hochul, and Northrup worked as a public defender in New York City. So can you give us the lay of the land of this race and help us understand why it was so competitive? Yeah, absolutely. This is an assembly district in Manhattan, and it was represented for the last 20 years by Danny O'Donnell, who was uh, kind of a stalwart Democratic assembly member. And there were a few long-term Democratic Assembly members who are retiring at the end of the year. Right. He's one yeah. of them. And the race to replace him, as you said, was Michael Lasher, who is, is a longtime kind of behind-the-scenes guy in mm -hmm. New York City and Albany politics. He uh, worked for the governor most recently. He used to work for the attorney general. He used to work for Michael Bloomberg. Uh, and he was up against... He was more of, a, of, of the, the centrist candidate versus... Mm -hmm. Eli Northrup, who is very much more of a progressive and, and was a public defender, had the backing of the Working Families Party and, say, Jumani Williams. He's the New York City public advocate who is well-respected among pro progressives, whereas Northrup, uh, I'm sorry, Lasher had more of the, uh, you might want to say, institutional backing. Yeah. The uh, Jerry Nadler mm -hmm. is the, the congressman in the area. He, he backed Lasher. You also had Brad Lander, the New York City um, Controller, and it was it was really an it was an interesting race, but it was one that Michael Lasher came out uh, came out ahead and and won, and he very much appears to be on on track to serving his two year term in Albany. Yeah, and as Michael Lasher is on you know track to winning the general election in November, how much of a benefit would you say? It is to Governor Kathy Hochul to have someone like Lasher in the assembly. He's, you know, as you mentioned, the former policy director, working closely with her through the years. And now he's going to be in the assembly, especially during, you know, very um, pivotal times in Albany, such as budget season or towards the end of session, where a lot of things are trying to get pushed through. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any governor to succeed in Albany needs allies in the legislature. And, and mm -hmm. Governor Hochul has fallen short on that sometimes. I mean, she, uh, she has, she, she was thrown into the position when, when Andrew Cuomo resigned. I mean, she had a lot of relationships in the legislature, but there have been times where uh, legislative leaders and, and Governor Hochul have uh, not seen eye to eye. So anytime she can get more allies in yeah. the legislature to pass her priorities, to pass her, uh, her agenda, to help guide that through, that is helpful, helpful to her. That said, Michael Lasher is going to be one of 150 members in the Assembly, one of yeah. 100 or so <laughs> Democrats. Yeah. And that is, uh, you know, one small piece of the puzzle. But you have to start somewhere and you have to build up more and more allies. And that's a good start. Yeah, absolutely. And now switching over to Assembly District um, 35, we know this is a district that is currently represented by Jeff Aubrey, who is retiring. Yeah, there, there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> uh, Jeff Aubrey is another one of those stalwart Democratic Assembly members who had been in office for decades and is leaving. He was the literal voice of the Assembly. He was yeah. he often served as the acting speaker and 
uh, would oversee uh, and, and guide the the uh, debates Especially. in in the assembly chamber. He's retiring. He there was a a two way primary to fill his seat. You mentioned the candidates. One of them is Hiram Montserrat. Hiram Montserrat has a long and complicated history exactly. in New York electoral politics. He was a former city council member. He was a former state senator who helped lead a coup of the state Senate back in, in 2009. He was a Democrat. He flipped over and he, he sided with Republicans and that led to this, this deadlocking of the, the Senate chamber that really ground Albany to a halt in 2009 before he flipped back. Then he was expelled from the chamber after he was convicted of misdemeanor assault. So after that, he went to prison on fraud charges that had to do with his time in the, in the city council. So long, complicated history. He has made many, many comeback attempts. Right. Uh, this was his fifth or sixth attempt at, at the legislature of the city council. He was unsuccessful. He, again, he was unsuccessful. He was defeated by Lorinda Hooks, who's a community district leader, uh, a Democratic district leader, and she appears ready to head to Albany now. Yeah, and I wanted to get into Assembly District 70. We know that this is a primary that Jordan Wright won. Most recently, he was working as the campaign man manager for Yusuf Salam, who is running for um, New York City Council. Yeah. And he's also the son of Keith Wright, who we know is a huge political force in New York, working as the leader of the Manhattan Democratic Party, and also represented that district yeah. years ago. So. Can you help? What did you make of um, Jordan Wright winning that Democratic primary and his future in Albany? Yeah, this was a crowded primary. Yeah. There were, there were yeah. several candidates. Jordan Wright came out on top. And it is really an extension of uh, <laughs> the family business, so to speak, because <laughs> yeah. uh, his, his father and grandfather were, were both also in politics. And, uh, you know, this is this is somebody who's on the rise. I mean, this yeah. you mentioned Youssef Salam. I mean, he kind of rose to prominence as the campaign manager for, for Youssef Salam, who was a, a member of the exonerated Central Park Five and, and really kind of stunned the establishment by winning a New York City Council seat. Now he will get his chance to, to show what he can do in office. You know, he's shown what he can do behind the scenes. Now he's going to be the person in that chair. And, and that's what he that's to the victor go the spoils. He won that that competitive multi-candidate race. And, and now he'll get to represent Harlem. Yeah. And now switching gears to the state Senate, I wanted to get into District 6. Um, there was a Democratic primary between Assemblymember Taylor Darling and Nassau County legislator um, Sila Bino. And it's my understanding that Taylor Darling is very beloved in her Assembly district, and she went on to want to represent the district in the Senate. She was endorsed by Kevin Thomas, but unfortunately, that wasn't enough to help her secure the nomination. So what did you make of that Race, and do you think it was a mistake for Darling to essentially give up, give up her seat in the assembly to try to um, vie for a Senate seat? Yeah, I mean, it's not essentially. That's what she did, and yeah. now she she did not win that primary. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I guess if if you know you could you view it as a mistake in that lens, sure. This is uh, this was complicated. There was a lot of internal party politics at play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taylor Darling, the assembly member, uh, you know, she felt as though the the party, the Democratic Party, didn't have her back. The chair of the Democratic Party donated to her opponent, Sheila Bino. Right. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, complicated intra-party politics at play. Sheila uh, Bino, the Nassau County legislator, she won. Uh, Kevin Thomas, as you mentioned, he is the state senator who is vacating that seat. He himself wanted to run for Congress. Mm -hmm. He was running for Congress for a period of months, dropped out of that race, declined to run for re-election. So he kind of has a similar situation. Right. There. Yeah. And in terms of um, state Senate District 50, this is a potential swing seat um, between Chris Ryan and Nick Paro. What will it take for either candidate to be victorious in this race? This is another race where you have a state legislator who has his eye on Congress. This mm -hmm. is right. a district in the Syracuse area that was, that is currently held by, by John Mannion, the senator, uh, and he's running for Congress. He, he won a primary of his own. So that leaves this vacancy. You have Chris Ryan, the Democrat. He's a Onondaga County legislator. He's the minority leader of the Onondaga County legislator versus, as you said, Nick Perro. He's the Salina Town supervisor. He's a Republican. 
that is always one of these races that is kind of a, a, a toss up and, and we still have, you know, the, the Senate is in solidly Democratic hands, but they're right kind of near that mark of what we call the supermajority, a two thirds okay. majority that can override any gubernatorial vetoes, although that hardly ever happens, exactly. hasn't <laughs> happened in, in more than a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, you know, it, it's a symbolic threshold, but that is one of the seats that will decide whether they hold on to it. And as we look ahead at the November um, general election, what are you looking forward to most? What are you closely monitoring and are there any potential for a political upset? Well, with no offense to uh, the, the people who fill the halls of the state capitol that we cover every day, <laughs> yeah. Uh, all eyes are going to be on Congress. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is just, it, it, New York can make or break whether Democrats or Republicans take control of the House of Representatives. That certainly was the case two years ago when uh, Governor Hochul had a, a, a poorer than expected showing in the, in the gubernatorial race, and there was trickle-down effect, and Republicans performed very well in swing congressional districts. We're, are we setting up for something similar this year with President Joe Biden not performing particularly well in New York, according to the polls? It's possible. So, yes, lots of Albany races to keep track of, but Congress is really where it's at this November. Absolutely. Well, certainly a lot to look forward to. We thank you so much for taking the time to connect with us, and we'd love to have you back on the show. But unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here for now. Thanks for having me. And we were speaking with John Campbell of WNYC and Gothamist. And we'll continue to monitor the races for state legislature and bring you the updates ahead of Election Day in November right here on the show. Now turning to another important topic. Social media child privacy has been a legislative priority for advocates, lawmakers, and high-ranking elected officials this year. Recently, Governor Kathy Hochul signed two popular social media child privacy bills into law. The Safe for Kids Act would restrict social media companies from using addictive feeds. And the New York Child Data Protection Act would restrict online sites from collecting the personal information of kids. Supporters say that addictive social media feeds negatively impact the mental health of kids. Meanwhile, tech leaders express opposition to the legislation, arguing that they may prevent users from building community and accessing resources. State Senator Andrew Gunnardis, who sponsors the legislation, spoke with us about its impact, garnering support, and the possibility of legal challenges. Here's that conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Senator. Thank you for having me. Now, for our viewers who may not have been paying close attention to these bills during the legislative session, can you give us some insight into how the New York um, Safer Kids Act and the Child Data Privacy Act will impact younger New Yorkers? So uh, basically, what we've been trying to do with these two bills is to respond to the dire public health crisis and mental health crisis affecting young people largely driven by social media. Uh, that's not Andrew Gennard is saying that. That's the U.S. Surgeon General, the chief public health officer in the country, who actually says that social media should come with warning labels because of the impact that it has on teenage mental health. So the Safe for Kids Act would restrict the ability of social media platforms to use algorithms to curate content for users under the age of 18 as a default feature. Um, and all that means is that those users would instead have a more chronological base feed that based on the pages and the accounts that they choose to follow, their friends, their family, the Yankees page, the New York Liberty page, the Taylor Swift fan page, whatever, but that the apps could not use an addictive algorithm to curate content for them that's designed intentionally to keep them scrolling longer and longer and longer and longer just to drive up their ad revenue. The second thing that the Safer Kids Act would do would be limit overnight notifications which you might think are you know, innocuous. Oh, you're getting, you're getting a reminder that someone commented on a post. But in fact, all those notifications are designed to do is to get you back onto the apps to keep scrolling again and then to addict you via that algorithm. So both of those features would be turned off. And then under the Child Data Protection Act, we're going to limit the ability of internet companies to collect personal data from minors without their consent just for commercial purposes. So all in all, this is gonna really help tilt the scales of balance back 
against these companies, which have been profiting immensely off the mental health crisis that they've helped cause. And when will these bills be going into effect? So the governor just signed both of these bills last week, and now for the next 180 days, the attorney general is going to be working on regulations to clarify exactly how the social media companies need to comply with the requirements of the law. And then after that, they'll, the law will go into effect, and there'll be a 180-day, you know, um, basically trial period for the apps to update their softwares in order to comply. But after that, within a year, there'll be full compliance expected with the law. And what will be the process of age verification for these apps? So that's going to be part of what the attorney general has to issue is with the um, with the regulations. But, but at, the law basically says that the attorney general's regulations have to be about commercially reasonable methods of age verification. These are by and large techniques and processes that the apps are already doing for their own internal compliance purposes. Think about it. Instagram does not want to be showing a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old content that's geared for a 13-year-old. And they don't mm -hmm. because they've developed their own internal methods to determine who is what age. And so by and large, a lot of what the verification requirements that the attorney general's regulations are going to include are going to be based around what the companies are currently doing for their own internal purposes. Uh, a lot of these apps have said that they cannot comply with the law, but the fact of the matter is they already know how old their users are. They just don't want to admit it because they don't want to see any of the changes we've proposed come into effect. And why has child um, internet safety be been one of your top legislative priorities as a lawmaker? I'm a parent. I have two kids. Um, they're not of social media age yet, but I am terrified, as I know a lot of parents are. And it's not just parents. It's young people themselves who have said they need help. They can't stop themselves from scrolling. You know, think mm -hmm. about cigarettes. We've learned that cigarettes were designed intentionally to addict people and that tobacco companies were intentionally marketing those cigarettes to kids because they wanted to create lifelong customers. The same thing is happening with social media. Um, and so we know that kids are asking for help. Parents definitely are asking for help. Doctors and, and pediatricians have said that there's a big problem with social media. Uh, teachers and educators say it's a problem in the classroom. So the more you think about it, the more you talk about it, and the more you, you learn about this, you realize just how dire a problem is. Um, and, you know, for the last decade, look at some of the statistics. Uh, girls age 11 to 13, their rates of hospital admissions for self-harm have tripled because of social media. That's a terrifying statistic. And there's, there's dozens more like that I could share with you that just points to how dire a problem this really is. And we know the attorney general's office was helpful in um, this legislation. So can you unpack your working relationship with the attorney general and her office in terms of getting these bills over the legislative finish line? Well, first and foremost, both the attorney general and myself are from Brooklyn. So, you know, we already have that bond <laughs> yes. keeping us together. Um, but, you know, the attorney general's office was really instrumental with us every step of the way, helping us craft the you know, legislative language, talking about strategy, legislative strategy, bill drafting strategy, because ultimately when these laws get challenged in court, the attorney general is going to have to be the one to defend them. And so it, be, it really is smart for all of us to make sure that her office is part of this process from the very beginning so that we have the best chance of making sure that these laws survive the litigation that's going to be inevitable and that we can present the best case forward for how, why, how and why these proposals, which are not radical and are not you know, anti-tech or are not about, you know, don't block content or whatever, uh, are really just common sense protections for some of the most vulnerable users of the internet, which are kids. And how much of an impact would you say having the support of both the attorney general's office as well as the executive chamber had on getting these bills over this finish line? Oh, it was really tremendous. I mean, you know, first of all, in order to get anything to become a law, you know, you need the governor's support. You need the governor's signature. Mm -hmm. So when the governor signals and says from the very beginning of the process, I'm behind this 100% of the way, you already know that you can see you can see the finish line and that you're going to have a, um, a new law because of this effort. And so having both the governor and the attorney general support was really instrumental. It called attention to the issue in ways that I by myself or my, you know, I and my colleagues could not do. And it really demonstrated the full commitment of all levels and branches of government to try to address this problem, which I said earlier is, is quite dire uh, and which needs resolution. You know, it'd be great, honestly, if, if we didn't have to do this. If, if Congress 
you know, got its act together and passed a national law. But the last time Congress did anything to protect kids on the internet was 1998. We were still getting America Online discs mailed to us every week back then. Think about how much the internet has changed since that time. Um, and so in the failure of the companies doing the right thing and in the failure of Congress doing the right thing, it falls to states like New York to lead the way and lead the way we are. And I'm really proud of that. And we know there was some criticism from coalitions within the technology industry who argued that the bills would restrict um, teens from being able to access some of the benefits that come along with social media, such as resources and access to community spaces. So what is your response to that pushback? It's false. <laughs> um, you know, the, the apps, like I said earlier, they don't want to change the status quo. They don't want to see any of these regulations put in place for one very important reason, because they make a lot of money off of this. In 2022, the biggest six social media companies made a combined $11 billion in ad sales just off of kids. Forget about us adults. That's just off of kids. So these apps have 11 billion reasons to not want to change anything. That's why they're going around saying that social media is good, that the algorithms are good, that they know what's best for protecting kids. But we know better. We see what's happening all the time. Just last week, the Wall Street Journal reported that Instagram was pushing sexual content to 13-year-olds. I mean, come on. They're going to sit there with a straight face and say they're doing everything they can and that they know best how to protect kids. And their technology, their algorithm is showing 13-year-olds sexual content. We can do better. That's why we pass these laws. And are you worried about any potential lawsuits that may come out to prevent these bills from getting into um, law? Or I know that they've been passed, but, you know, essentially being enacted. We expect the laws to be challenged by either the companies themselves or by their trade associations. We feel we've drafted it in a way that is incredibly strong, that avoids a lot of the legal issues that might otherwise arise whenever you try to regulate forms of speech. Uh, we don't believe that an algorithm, a piece of computer code, is uh, protected First Amendment speech, um, and that nothing in this law goes to touch on the content that is shown on social media. All we are saying is that how that content is being curated for kids needs to be regulated. Very different than saying no social media for kids. Very different than saying you have to ban certain types of content which is what other states have done, which is why other states have had their laws struck down. Ours takes a very different approach. We are the first state in the country to go after the algorithm itself and not the content. And how would you describe the overall process of getting these bills passed? Was there anything that surprised you, for example, in terms of the support or even the criticism that you received? Uh, well, you know, we had unanimous support in the state Senate when the vote came, and we only had one vote against our bill in the state assembly. So I was surprised by just how overwhelmingly supportive both the Democrats and Republicans were of this measure. But I guess I really shouldn't be that surprised because this polls incredibly well. And Tara, like I said earlier, everyone's concerned about what's happening on social media as it relates to young kids. Um, and I'm also not surprised by the opposition that we got from the tech companies because, again, this is their status quo. This is their business model. This is how they make money. And so they don't want to see any regulations put in place. Um, I guess the one thing I would say is I underestimated just how much they would fight us and how much they would try to fight us behind the scenes, was, you know, waging a, a vigorous whisper campaign to try to sow doubt and confusion about what our bills would do and about why our bills should not be passed. But I'm glad to say, and, and spending millions of dollars in the meantime, by the way, uh, but I'm glad to say that we overcame that opposition and that these bills did become law. And now that the bills have been passed and signed into law, what are some other ways that you're hoping to further protect kids using social media? Well, look, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, there is a conversation to be had about the role of phones and social media in school that I know mm -hmm. the governor mentioned a few weeks ago she wants to start talking about. I know a lot of parents and educators want to start talking about. I think we need to start talking about it. I also think there's a level of education here as well, right? Just like, you know, to use the cigarette or the alcohol example I referenced earlier, yes, we put laws in place to protect minors from cigarettes and alcohol and to ban the sale and the marketing, but we also require family members and parents and loved ones to have conversations with their young people about the harmful effects here. And so I think there's also space here for a conversation amongst families about the role of technology in our lives, how to use it positively, how it can be used negatively, 
and how to put protections in place for yourself um, that I think we need to start having. But the onus should never be just on the user and should never be just on the parent. The companies here who are responsible for this need to bear the brunt of this responsibility because they've designed their products intentionally to addict us. They actually use, they actually study, you know, the impact of slot machine gambling in casinos. And they've tried to replicate that same effect with how they've designed their algorithm and their feeds. And if you notice, you keep scrolling through your feed, you keep coming back for more, for more, for more, just like a gambling addict, keep coming back for more and more and more, one more pull at the slot machine, one more pull, one more pull, the same exact thing. So we have a lot more work to do in this space. Well, certainly a lot to look forward to, um, but we thank you for taking the time to connect with us on this issue. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you. And we were speaking with State Senator Andrew Gennardis, a Brooklyn Democrat. And for more information and resources on the legislation meant to protect children using social media in New York, you can visit our website. Again, that's at nynow.org. You can also subscribe to our newsletter by going to newsletter.nynow.org or by scanning the QR code on your screen. Well, that does it for this edition of New York Now. Thank you for tuning in and see you next week. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.